Thank you. Um, I had no kittens. I didn't get the memo. I'm sorry. I have no kittens. Um, but um, also, I have no PowerPoint. Um, I just, I'll break that to you now. Uh, what you're going to see on the screen is just a loop of a lot of uh, source documents. So it's all of the archival materials um, that I'm working with um, as part of this game. So my idea is that they will give you um, some kind of um, affective relationship to, um, to what I'm trying to accomplish, um, and not a lot more than that. Uh, hopefully, they'll also give you something a little bit more um, interesting to look at as we uh, as we go along here. So let me, hello. Okay. So I'm here to talk about Go Queer, a locative media experience I'm developing about the queer history of Edmonton, Canada, a Western city of about a million people that saw its most significant development and growth in the 20th century. Um, also home to BioWare, I think a company some of you might have heard of. <laughs> uh, known in Cree as Amasquatchi Waskahegan, it's been continually inhabited for over 5,000 years, serving as a meeting place for the Cree, the Papas Chase, the Dene, and Métis peoples on the traditional territories of Treaty 6. Unsurprisingly, Edmonton has spent a considerable part of its colonial past forcibly erasing its indigenous histories subscribing instead to a narrative of bootstrapping progress and pioneering his resiliency. So while engaging with the settler colonial history of Edmonton is a theoretical and political project for another paper, I must nonetheless acknowledge always that this is the legacy on which I live and on which Go Queer situates itself. So what is Go Queer? The title is of course a playful nod to Pokemon Go uh, though I want to add, I have been at this longer than Pokemon Go has been out, but whatever. Um, so it challenges its players to go queer in the sense of to turn queer, uh, but also to go and queer, meaning to go and question, investigate, analyze, disrupt. It shares Pokemon Go's serendipitous scavenger hunt mechanic, but instead of discovering a Pikachu, users discover hidden queer histories. When users happen upon specific locations, there's more than 50 at this point, the app alerts them and displays text, images, video, and or audio in place, bringing together the physical navigation of the contemporary city with the imaginative navigation of its queer past. I like to think of it as a ludic locative media experiment, an experience that occurs on location in the city on the playful border between game and story the present and the past, and the queer and the straight. I'm a digital humanist. That means I build stuff. My scholarship is about asking techno ask, is about taking technological affordances and using them to try to generate knowledge. My questions as I make things are, how do you theorize as you build? How do you iterate ethically? How do you question and embed a politics in a digital object? One of the questions that I ask frequently in my work is, what does it mean to use theoretical thinking as the starting point for building? The consequence is that I've been thinking through this project theoretically. That is, I've been setting myself a theoretical framework to think with, through, and against, and I've been developing the game from the insights that the theory has given me. I always tell my students that the test of a theory is, what does it give you to think? So Go Queer is my evolving answer to the questions posed by queer theory, the spatial humanities, and game studies. The first theoretical pass I took at this material was largely grounded in the intersection of queer theory and spatial theory. I wanted to ask how I might build a game that needed to be played queerly, that is, a game that asked its players to take on movements and affects that would be familiar and recognizable to queers. This resulted in one instance of clarity, an article in television and new media that deploys Sarah Ahmed's explication of queer orientations and living a slant as spatial metaphors for queer experience. So for those who aren't familiar with Ahmed's work, she argues that, quote, to be oriented is to be oriented towards certain objects, 
those that help us find our way. She claims that queers are differently oriented to a spatial world that is the product of extended and extensive heteronormativity. Because spaces are already coded to make, quote, some bodies feel in place or at home and not others, unquote. As a result, spaces have a kind of straightening effect that queerness always experiences at a slant from a different orientation. So I combined this phenomenological approach with spatial theories of the derive and queer urban space in order to arrive at what I think of as the alpha version um, of go queer. Ultimately, this version of the game is premised on the argument that queerness most frequently stands as a disruptive challenge to normative structures, be they identities, institutions, cultural productions, or ways of being in the world. It proposes that a productive setting for queer play is the space of the city itself, and that the hybrid reality of locative media provides particular affordances to enable particularly queer navigations, occupations, and constructions of urban space. So I'm now working through a different theoretical lens in the hopes that it will push my thinking and design on the game to what I might call a beta version, um, one that would be suitable for play testing or, as I like to think of it, think testing. I have to tell you, this paper marks my first attempt to think through the game using a new theoretical lens. So please be generous. You'll find that many of my theoretical observations are a little bit more intuitive than they are well argued, both because I haven't yet formed the solid arguments I need, but also because I was really excited to be here for this weekend and to see all of the ways that um, the conversations that are going on here might influence how I think through this, this, this project. So the theoretical model that I'm thinking through now is a model loosely based on the idea of publics and counterpublics and in relation memory and counter-memory. So if one of the arguments I've embedded in Go Queer is that movement through space can be read and enacted as queer, now I want to embed an argument that the game can produce a counter-public space by placing players in dialogue with both counter-memories of the past and with one another. So that's a lot to unpack. See my previous comment about intuitive connection um, but I'm going to start with some basic definitions, then I'm going to try to link them into some kind of a framework, and then finally I'm going to share some initial ideas I have about how I can act, enact those things in the game itself. So, the term counter-public was originally coined in response to Habermas's work on the public sphere. The concept gained some traction in queer theory circles via the work of Lauren Berlant and Michael Warner in Sex and Public, and of course it became a core concept in queer theory with Warner's subsequent book, Publics and Counterpublics. Both of, those comp the, both of those concepts are complex, public and counterpublic, it's Habermas after all, but at their core, they're quite straightforward. Publics are constructed places where people, as subjects, and in their subjectivity, feel that they belong. A nation is one kind of public, a classroom another. But when subjects feel alienated and excluded from that very public sphere, they can, under cir certain circumstances, form counterpublics, that is, public spaces that explicitly reject the exclusionary normative logic of those places where they don't belong. Counterpublics created by queers in opposition to the heteronormative public sphere might include things like tea rooms, or lesbian separatist spaces, or polyamorous communities, or gay bars, or dungeons, or bookstores, or sex shops, to name just a few of the counterpublics with which many of us will be familiar. The counterpoint of the counterpublic finds its analog in the counter of countermemory. Most fully elaborated by Foucault, countermemory, quote, makes visible all those discontinuities that cross us, unquote. Engaging in the work of countermemory is crucial since, and this is Foucault again, history will not discover a forgotten identity eager to be reborn, but a complex system of distinct and multiple elements unable to be mastered by the powers of synthesis. So Go Queer is built on a foundation of counter-memories, deliberately making both the meanings and the contradictions of the past available in the present. 
It doesn't seek to recuperate or valorize any kind of official queer history by tidally reconciling discordant elements of the past and subsuming uncomfortable details into an overarching narrative of progress. Rather, Go Queer's counter memories actively exploit the ragged density of past experience. It isn't only the content of the narratives, but also their structure that makes them counter memories. On the one hand, they tell the stories of history from below, the stories of cruising and cruising parks of bars, drag houses, the stories of court cases and harassments and witch hunts, the stories of political organizing, of sexism and exclusion, of the rendering invisible of indigenous and two-spirit peoples. They tell the stories of gentrification and privilege, the stories of mainstreaming. At the same time, by placing these stories alongside one another spatially, Go Queer resists the, quote, powers of synthesis and forces messy, incongruous histories to coincide. So this is where things start getting a little murky, <clears throat> for me at least. Um, Christopher Castiglia has helped me uh, to bring the idea of counterpublics and countermemories together. He's done extensive work on the relationship between communal and collective countermemory and the construction of subjectivity among gay men. He argues that, and this is a fairly long quote, sexual culture is not a settled space, but a memory of practices, signs, and positionalities that enables tea rooms, discos, and cruising areas to travel without disappearing. Well, sorry, cruising areas to travel without disrupting, or at least for not very long, their functions. The impermanence of these spaces, if anything, suggests the resilience of the networks through which culture circulates. It is relationships created through shared memory that provide the architecture of the queer world." Unquote. So, how can I make visible the networks through which memory circulates? How can I create relationships through shared memory that provide the architecture of a queer world? I have three provisional answers based on three keywords from Castiglia memory, network, and relationships. So, one way is through narrativizing memory itself. And this is uh, uh, painting a scene from the game itself as if you're playing it on location. Stand on the corner of 105th Street and 105th Avenue, looking west down the avenue. The gentrification of the area is apparent from the dotting of loft condo buildings on the left, while the low-rise warehouse spaces persist on the right. A shopping district one block to the south literally turns its back on the avenue, and something in the gap marks a boundary and a division between here and there. The app chimes in and reminds us that the gap, a continuous urban scar through the western edge of the downtown, was once the railway tracks, and that we are on the wrong side of them. While the proper city lingers in the form of a parking lot for Chintz and Company, the queer past comes spilling from the alley in front of you. It's 1981, and the Pisces Spa, a gay bathhouse, is being raided. Almost 50 law enforcement officers are participating, arresting and taking photographs of the 56 found-ins charged that night. It's been only three months since a similar raid swept up hundreds in Toronto, and the fear, anxiety, and anger of the community are evident in the photos, newspaper articles, and court transcripts that are now contained in that alley. The, stories of the, Pisces, the story of the Pisces raid is a specific story, but it is also, of course, a terribly generic one. That same story is played out in cities across North America, and just when we think it can't happen again, to select one random recent example, the Toronto police are undertaking an ongoing sting operation in a popular cruising park in the city's west end in the name of public safety. That's like happening right now. The gay men have been continually rounded up by law enforcement at various urban haunts is no surprise. But by linking these events together and showing how they function is one of the ways to draw attention to, quote, the networks through which memory circulates. In Go Queer, I'm attaching locations and events together in what we're calling sets to demonstrate the structural similarities between and among 
seemingly disparate moments of queer history, building a network of knowledge for the player. So the Pisces raid will belong to the set Sex Panic, but it'll also be placed alongside other historical events that share the same contours. It'll be part of a set called Public Sex, a set called the 1980s, a set called The Police. By placing the story in dialogue with all of these other stories, the player can see the richness of content that the individual place offers and can imagine what other places might be available for discovery in the game. Just as one bathhouse closes, surely another opens. So where can I look? Finally, it's the players themselves who connect those memories and networks into relationships. Through the repetition of tactical navigation and the repeated discovery of hybrid experience of the game's locations, players begin to travel the same paths and occupy the same spaces and the same shared memories. The game notifies them of how many players have found a particular location, and through social media plugins, how many of their connections have done the same. Like the paradox of desire lines, and this is Ahmed again, which are both created by being followed and are followed by being created, the queer memories and pathways of the city begin to accrete through the screens and steps of the players. The gameplay then moves beyond the individuated experience and becomes, ideally, a collective, public, and communal experience. Following from a long theoretical tradition of understanding queerness as necessarily embedded in and dependent on counter public spaces for its legibility and its politics, that is, its very counter publicness, it's precisely in its collective, public, and communal expression that I hope the game is at its most queer. <laughs>